welcome to a very special episode of Retro Game Lounge, where Chuck and I, we're not really going to be playing any games today. Uh, this episode is just going to be kind of our personal MAGFest roundup. Uh, Chuck and I were lucky enough to attend MAGFest this past Saturday. It runs for four days, actually. Uh, so we went on the second to last day, which is supposed to be the biggest day. It was my first MAGFest, Chuck's first MAGFest. Heard a lot about it. Uh, this is MAGFest 12. Um, I know that may sound kind of funny since it took place in 2014, but it's the 12th year of MAGFest. They've been doing it since 2002. Uh, for those of you unaware, it's actually a really big deal. Um, it's one of the largest gaming conventions out there, and probably the, ret the biggest retro gaming convention out there, They're definitely one of the biggest, um, in North America at least. And they have all kinds of things, you know, retro games, modern games, arcade gaming, console games, music, um, you know, Q&A, panels, you know, all kinds of stuff. So it's kind of almost like a little miniature Comic-Con for retro gamers, more or less. Uh, so we went there, you know, we had uh, pretty much the, the majority of the afternoon to hang out there and check things out, go to the vendors, uh, play some arcade games and everything. So we thought we would uh, take you guys along with us and uh, show you what it was like. So what do you say we check it out? This place is insane. Uh, right now we are in the arcade section. You might be able to see behind us. This is literally like, I don't know about you, man, but this is like the biggest arcade I've ever seen. Uh, it's pretty I mean, this is enormous. Like the arcade literally goes from one side of the, of the, uh, the convention center to the other. I mean, it, it's enormous. There's got to be a couple of hundred games here. And everything is free to play. Uh, vendors, awesome, guys. You gotta check it out. Like seriously, this is awesome. Okay, so we cannot talk about MAGFest without talking about the arcade segment. That's definitely one of the biggest, if not the biggest draw um, oh, yeah. to people that, that attend this. Um, basically how it works is, as I understand it, it's a bunch of guys who do exactly what I do. They, they collect arcade cabinets and they basically bring them in um, from sometimes all over the country to this event and all the games there are set up for free play. Thank you for that. Yeah, I know. Seriously, thank you for that. That's awesome. So, it doesn't really seem to stick to one particular era of arcading. Um, Chuck and I have basically been alive throughout like 98% of the arcade heyday. Um, you know, Pac-Man came out a little bit before us, but I mean, we remember Pac-Man, Galaga, you know, Space Invaders, all that kind of stuff, all the way up through the 90s, you know, with Mortal Kombat. So, this, this kind of gala event has everything in between. Like, anything like as early as Pac-Man or Vectrex or stuff like that, all the way up through, you know, Killer Instinct, Mortal Kombat, you know, Sega GT, Cruising Exotica, every even up to Dance Dance Revolution. Yeah, I was gonna say the dancing century. games. I mean, this really covers A through Z um, as far as you know what your style of arcade is. And again, everything's free play, so you can play it to your heart's content. We couldn't help but notice when we were walking around, you know, how many, you know, how many cabinets we saw that just kind of brought a smile to our face, like, like, oh my God, remember that one? Like, oh well, oh, the the fucking best. Are you kidding? The six player X-Men cabinet. Are the, you kidding? The Uber edition of the oh. one you, like the one that guys like me oh. want. Three screens put together. It's six nice. simultaneous players. As far as I know, that's the only simultaneous six player arcade game ever released. It's so sick. That definitely has to be the biggest arcade cabinet ever made. I mean that's I've never seen anything like that. And that one, that nice. one had a pretty big line. Like that one, they were rocking six players the whole Constant. fucking time we were there. <laughs> and understandably so. I mean, that's, yeah. I wish I could have one, guys, but it wouldn't fit through most people's door. You'd have to take it apart or cut a hole in the wall. Yeah, you need the double French door yeah. before <laughs> you, you even would. think about that. I know. So they had stuff like that. Um, the one game that they had there that we never got to play because it was always busy, Bad Dudes. Oh, yeah. I wanted to play that so bad. Um, the NES version not so great like it's okay it brings back memories because i owned it when i was a kid but i mean the arcade version of bad dudes it was one of those things we were talking about this while we were there i wanted to beat the level not just to say i beat the level i wanted to hear like i'm bad at the end i mean like to like eight and nine year old chuck and jimbo that was the payoff you know that you got to see like this like jacked up roid monster just like i'm bad you know i mean <laughs> that was fucking awesome <laughs> so unfortunately we didn't get to play that that one had a big line but I mean, they had three Mario Brothers cabinets, um, they had the original, um, the PlayChoice 10 Nintendo cabinets, the Nintendo Super System, I've got the sign for them, you'll see that in your video, I've got the sign for that right up there above above the closet door in the Retro Game Lounge. Um, the race, tabletops? Yeah, the tabletops, the cocktails, um, the big racing games, you know, Crazy Taxi, fucking Sega GT, 
Outrun. Um, they had pinball machines. They had some of the really good pinball machines. Oh, too. yeah. Elvira. They had the Super Mario Brothers pinball machine. Dude. Yeah. Talk about number one on my list. I mean, there was just... If you had any appreciation for anything to do with arcades, I will guarantee you they had at least one game. That oh, you yeah. would have been like, I gotta fucking play You would have had fun. So, I mean, it was just awesome. And I don't know about you, man, but I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that that's the most arcade machines I have ever seen in one place. In one spot, I think I can say that. And then that's not even counting all the consoles they had set up. Exactly. Every console you can think of. Yeah, I mean, they just, like, right in front of the arcade things, they had arcade machines, they had just row after row of consoles with TVs set up, so people playing GoldenEye, you know, just, um... People you know, duck hunt. Like. Yeah, <laughs> duck hunting, like Super Metroid, you know, just fighting games. They had Halo on the original Xbox set up. Um, just all kinds of stuff. I mean, this is, this really spoke to everyone on some level who's into video games. Yeah. So, on to the vendors. Um, before we get too much into that, I just want to throw in a little personal note. Um, this is something we were discussing while we were there, that we were kind of surprised and maybe a little bit bewildered that there weren't more retro game vendors. I mean, there, there definitely was some. There was more than one table. Um, just selling a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but I, I mean for something like this We were kind of expecting them to follow the same general approach that like comic-con does to comic books I mean, I, I understand that there are people at comic-con selling different things But I mean the majority of the vendors there are still selling comic books So we were kind of expecting that same thing, but with retro games and again there were vendors there it's just I would have pegged it at like 60% um, you know, retro gaming uh, vendors, like that's what I was expecting. I was gonna go 50, 55. And it wasn't yeah. close to that. Not so even. <laughs> it was, it like was what? 25% maybe. So See, I think you're being generous. I might be. Because maybe, maybe 20%. Because you're talking about games, right? but I think you might also be factoring in the art vendors and things like that. That's true, that's, there true. Was, that's true. There was a lot of that. That was great. There was. Like everything there, for the most part, was gaming related. There were a few exceptions, but 99% of the stuff there, obviously, was was gaming, ga really? gamiana, you know, right, whatever you right. want to call it. So, onto the vendors themselves. All right. Well, the first thing that kind of surprised me, and I'm not, I'm not going to speak for all the vendors there. I had a good experience with a few. I had some not bad experiences, but just kind of, again, bewildered experiences. Just okay. So. One of the guys um, was uh, selling a PlayStation game. I'm, I won't tell you which one because it's honestly irrelevant. But anyways, he had a price of 10 bucks. Again, not a lot for a PlayStation game, but this isn't a super rare game. And <clears throat> I'm always one, guys, to support local businesses over the big corporate machine. Like, I'll, if it's, if, if the price difference is negligible, normally I'll just give it to him. So I'm going to keep the little guy in business. So that's not normally an issue with me. But with this particular dude, he was literally asking for twice the going rate at ten dollars and i'm sure you might be saying to yourself well you know five bucks isn't really a big deal jim but well no obviously to me five bucks isn't a big deal because look around you but it's it's a it's not really the the price that's the issue here it's more just the principle it's i tried to reason with the guy I wasn't a dick like you know you're overcharging or anything like that i didn't you know try and strong arm him into doing this i did show him the going rate for the game, and I did it, I think, in a polite way. You did? Um, you were. And I was like, you know, the, dude, this game is selling for like five eighty nine shipped, you know, complete right here, and I showed him the listing. So you kind of use the online market as the measuring stick for what people are willing to pay because your pool for what people will buy is much larger yes. when you use the Internet because then your, yes. your marketplace is the entire planet, more or less. So... He's like, he's like, I can't go 50% of it. I was like, I made it very clear to him, like, bro, I understand you got to make money. Like, I'm not, I'm not trying to take your food away from you. But at the same time, you've got to give me a reason to give you my money. Like, I, I understand that, you know, you need money, you need a business and stuff like that. But, bro, this isn't a charity. Yeah, I mean, this, this is business. And it would be business stupid of me to pay twice the value of something just to make somebody else feel better. I mean, he, it wasn't Chuck the vendor, you know, a friend of mine, so I'm not supporting his business. That would be a different story if it's a personal friend of mine. This is Jimbo versus total fucking stranger. So it's, he was nice about it. He wasn't an ass. He's like, you know, the table cost me like $3,000. Okay, I get that this costs money and I get you have to make money, but 
that doesn't get you a hundred percent markup on my fucking game, dude. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm sorry, it doesn't. So, again, I'm not speaking for all the vendors there. Um, I had a fantastic experience um, with one of the vendors, which we'll get to a little bit later in the video. Um, some of them were definitely there to deal, and they were definitely very reasonable with their prices. Um, some of them just had their fucking head up their ass when it comes to prices. It, I don't know how else to say this, guys, but a couple of the vendors that we saw, it's like they didn't know that eBay existed. Like, like the price is like, like you can't get this anywhere else. Uh, yeah, I can, dude. Like, uh, this thing called the internet makes getting anything you want possible. You know who you are. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's... You know who you are. You have a merce. Yes. A merce. <laughs> you have a merce. So... Come on. When you're basically saying, like, you know, like, uh, 50 bucks, you know, is the bottom line or something like that, well... All right, like I guess you got a bottom line, dude. We've all got a bottom line. You got a bottom line for what you're willing to sell for. I've got a bottom line for what I'm willing to pay for it. If we can't meet in the middle, that's fine. Maybe you'll find someone else who's going to buy it. But I just think, given the crowd that they're catering to there, guys, come on. The majority of the collectors there know the market. They've done their homework. They're more or less, I would say, the majority of them probably guys like me um, who collect stuff like this and who understand what the typical going rate is for a semi-known game, like a, a Nintendo first-party game, for example. We all know the prices of those. You know, I mean, it's continually going up, but we all pay attention. Uh, by the way, guys, a little interesting tidbit for you when we're talking about vendors. Um, I actually ran into somebody from YouTube while I was actually just looking at a vendor. I was looking at games. It was actually kind of weird. I always wondered if this would happen in one of these gaming conventions. So... Um, we're, Chuck and I are walking around, we're checking out the vendors, and I just noticed this gentleman that looks familiar, um, sitting there going through the games just like a regular person, and it's Pat the NES Punk, just going through there like a regular Joe. What's up, bud? I know, it's just kind of surprising because, I, I mean, I'm sure he still collects games, but, I mean, I would think with a collection like that, I mean, hey, you know, maybe he's just fishing like the rest of us. You know, you never know what you're going to find in one of these things. Hey, you know, not hating on him or anything. It's just, I don't know, I just found that kind of surprising because he's got such an all-encompassing collection. I, I don't know. But, I mean, it was cool. I went up, you know, introduced myself and said hi. He was, he was very polite. He was a very nice guy. Um, Chuck actually also ran into someone uh, from the YouTube world. Uh, <coughs> I didn't. We actually separated for a minute while I went off to to uh, check out some games, but... Yeah, we, yeah we separated, and I kind of... We'll it, use the term meet loosely. It's, it's a uh, really funny story. Yeah. Brother had a rough night the night before. Tequila and Fireball don't really mix well in the stomach, especially when you work all night and you stay up and then you go into a convention. It's just brewing... Brother had to take a shit. So, I'm running to the convention center just looking for a place to just dump ass. Like, like it, it was coming. It was coming. And, of course, I see somebody I actually watch. I follow the Cinema Snob. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Cinema Snob, right there. I would love to meet you. I got a shit. Peace. Never saw him again. I would have liked to have talked to him. But I had more pressing matters to deal with. Um, some of the other vendors we saw, like like I mentioned earlier, um, almost everything there was video game related. Um, so, but it wasn't just video games. All kinds of stuff, you know, hats, um, t-shirts, and everything. There was one guy who's making uh, these really cool, almost like 3D posters. I guess you could say, like like a miniature diorama of famous scenes from like NES games. Like they had one showing. Uh, the training segment from Punch Out, where Little Max, you know, running in his pink jumpsuit, and um, and Joe is behind him, you know, on the bike, on the bike yeah. and um, you know, it was just kind of like the whole thing had scale and depth. You know, it wasn't just flat; it wasn't a hologram or anything like that. It was actually, you know, two distinct images or pieces of art, you know, showing the contrast. And I wish we had gone over there to check those out more. I just kind of thought about that in hindsight that that would be something really cool um, to have hanging here on the on the wall of the Retro Game Lounge, but. Um, just all kinds of, of little things like that, of people selling stuff. Like they had guys selling Nuka-Colas, you know, cans of Nuka-Cola from um, from Fallout. and all, Pretty much everything. If you like anything about video games, there was probably something there that you would stop and check out one way or the other. I'm sorry, I gotta say it. There was at least one really whack vendor 
the, the I'm not this, gonna point anybody out. This is the Super Nintendo one. Yeah, yes. Yes, I gotta. I gotta admit, this dude was off his fucking rock. <coughs> All right, what was the price on it again? Was it eighty bucks? Eighty bucks okay. for a piss yellow, like oh Seriously. my god! Seriously. All right, not and not even not even the the miniature Super Nintendo, not even the harder to find. The standard original Super Nintendo unit, yellow as fuck. It looks like someone lit up next to it with a blunt for like three <sighs> years and blew into it. Like the dude blows his cartridge like, like that. Like that's what it looked like. This thing was yellow as shit. And he's like, he had it all saran wrap. It's a ran wrap. Like, it's a like ran he was wrap. Preserving it. Like a fucking derelict mummy. I know. Like, like, this was really bad. And he was like, he wanted eighty dollars for that, dude. I can tell you off the top of my fucking head what a loose Super Nintendo system, complete with all the cords, goes for. That's forty bucks I don't even all think day the long. I don't, I don't think, think he, had, he had a controller with it, but I don't think control, I don't think he had complete a without the box, controllers, and accoutrements, and everything like that. Forty bucks shipped all day long, and and that's with that's probably one that's in a little bit better shape. I mean, this thing looked like it had cancer. I wouldn't give him ten bucks no. for this one. And he's like, oh, eighty bucks, what a deal! I'm like, are you fucking high? Like seriously, man? Like I'm not trying to fuck up your shit here, but that's just stupid. I mean, guys. My complete in box Super Nintendo system that's up there with a good shape box with the styrofoam in it was ninety dollars. What the fuck? I mean, seriously, we both know that when you add the box and the original styrofoam, you nine nine times out of ten you double the price. So if if I'm paying ninety bucks for that, it should have been forty forty five bucks uh, for the original system. This dude was just. If, out, I'm out trying to be nice. I'm trying to be. I'm Don't trying be. to be nice. I'm not being nice. Skull it. Get it together. <laughs> get it together. Stop, Holy stop shit! Stop ripping people off. We're not idiots. Good God! I mean, that was just yeah. That's, I, I, we saw that and we checked the fuck out of that. Like, I was does, like, fuck this. How guy. the fuck does he even show up there with that merchandise and trying to charge that much? I know. Like. He's like Never, a bad used car dealer. Like, out of the... Because, like I said, I expected more vendors. Right. So, I'm, I'm not disappointed, but why was that guy fucking there? I don't know. Like, Because he paid $3,000 for the table. For shame. And he had, like, three tables. I, I know... Uh, <laughs> the grand on that one table was wasted. <laughs> oh, oh, my Because he wasn't selling shit. He wasn't selling not shit. Not at that price. You'd have to be an idiot to buy that. No, did, so. did you see his little Game Boys? Yeah. His, uh, what? Not yeah. in good condition. I mean, I understand, guys. There is a market for things that aren't in perfect condition. You can restore um, these things. There's a lot of videos on YouTube of how to how to get rid of the yellowing on these. Dude, consoles. it looked like you'd get a hep C from that thing. It did, but I mean, if if you're gonna sell a system that is in need of restoration, it needs to be at the needs restoration price. Thank you. Not at the more than good condition price. I don't. Th I don't think we're being unreasonable there. <laughs> I, I think we're I being think so. pretty sensible, but yeah, you know, it's all good. So speaking of vendors, um, while Chuck was off playing the brown nun, basically, brown falcon. Sorry, right. but ah. Um, I was actually um, we went and dealing with a particular vendor. Um, so Chuck went off and did this thing. I was like, dude, I'm I'm gonna be here for a little bit. So just come on back. And I was like, I'll be gone yeah. for a bit. <laughs> so, <laughs> So I was looking at this one guy who had a, he had a nice display case, and what caught my eye was he had TurboGrafx games. Um, there were other people that had them, but this guy definitely had more than any of the other vendors. Um, and the majority of he the majority of the ones he had were in box, which is really unusual, um, definitely in my opinion. So um, I was checking out a few of them, and I saw first of all one that um, it's not super rare, but it's definitely one of the ones to get if you've got a TurboGrafx, and that would be. Utopia. Um, so obviously I bought it, uh, but a little bit of story behind it. Um, the thing on it that really caught my eye, his price was easily twenty dollars under the going rate because I've looked into buying this many times. I mean, Utopia, guys, for those of you not in the know, is the Zelda of the TurboGrafx-16. It's more or less a Zelda clone, but I mean, it's 16-bit. You know, it's definitely its own game. It doesn't completely copy Zelda. It's just kind of the same style of top-down, you know, little little guy hack and slash RPG. If you like that, you like this, and. He was selling it for $29.99, and again, with the case, with the manual, 
even has the sleeve on the card. I mean, you know, not complete in box, but I mean, look, that's that's pretty complete for a Turbo Graphics game. I wasn't even gonna haggle him on that one, dude. I mean, I was like, dude, he's selling it for 20 under retail. Um, yeah, sold. So without showing my poker face on that one, you know, uh, just too much. He had another game there, and I'm gonna level with you guys. This was more or less my holy grail um, games. Um, I've said uh, a few times before, guys, I'm a big fan of the Bomberman series. Um, that's Bomberman is my Mickey Mouse, dude. I, I absolutely love it. It's my favorite series to collect for. Uh, if for none other reason, something I realized recently, Bomberman is the only game series that I can collect on every single console that I own, even Turbo Graphics. Everything that I've got over in the corner there, Nintendo 64, GameCube, Dreamcast, Saturn, Genesis, NES, Super NES, Turbo Graphics, all of those, PlayStation, PlayStation 2, every single one of those has at least one Bomberman game. I challenge you to find another franchise that you can say that for, because you'll probably find one that has all of them, but the Turbo Graphics. So that's to me that's what ma really makes it special, other than the fact that I, I just love it. They're fun little games. Um, the game that he had was Bomberman '93. Uh, which I would say is probably in the top five rarest TurboGrafx-16 games ever made. Uh, maybe number four um, behind things like uh, Blanc 3 and um, there's another work and designs game in there, I think. And I've only seen this one for sale, I think, three times, like ever. Um, even on eBay, believe me, I check for this really often. And every time I see it, um, it's either like just the loose cue card or maybe it's just the manual or something like that like it's I've never seen one in a complete package it's always like bits and pieces and the price is always through the goddamn roof um, because they're so hard to find so this guy had it in the box with the manual with the cue card with the sleeve doesn't have the CD slipcase that's disappointing but his price um, at face value equitable I was able to talk him down a little bit, so I, I basically made him take off 20 bucks on it since I was I was agreeing to buy Newtopia too. I was like, you know, if I take them both, you know, can, can we work this out? And they went back and forth for a minute, and he finally agreed, and I got it. So, it's pretty much all downhill from here as far as the Bomberman collection, because this is the rarest Bomberman game ever. Um, some of you might argue that the Saturn game is a little rarer. Okay. The Saturn game is probably equally expensive, that's right around the $100 mark as far as the value, but guys, I see the Saturn Bomberman on eBay all the time. I've seen this on eBay like three times. So as far as rarity, this has definitely got to be rare. So I am just absolutely elated uh, to get this, man. I mean, if you ask Chuck, the smile on my face like would not have been removed for at least 20 minutes after oh I was god. I was giddy. Yeah. You know, just to actually see, I was like, oh my god, they actually have it. As soon as like I that saw was it. all we needed for the whole convention brand. As yeah. soon as he got that, that like sold, he was <laughs> done. Like that, it was just yeah, so happy. Okay, so there was another vendor there who was selling, um, wasn't selling games, but like T-shirts, all kinds of little collectibles and things like that. And his specialty seemed to be Valve games. So he had like a lot of Half-Life stuff, Portal. Um, Left 4 Dead, um, just a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Like he had the Bull Shifter shirt from Left 4 Dead 2. And he had one thing there that I've seen online, but I've never actually seen anyone selling it before. And that would be the first aid pack from Left 4 Dead. I mean, this isn't just something you hang on your wall, guys. This is actually, Usable. yeah, it's a working mini backpack. And if you wear it using the straps, it basically goes on your body exactly the way that the characters were in Left 4 Dead. So it's like a one-to-one -one perfect replica of the actual kit. I was like, okay, I've got to have that. Yeah. Like, if nothing else, this would make kick-ass cosplay. You know, because it's so easy to play a Left 4 Dead character because they look like regular people. So, I thought this was really awesome. This is only about 30 bucks. And if nothing else, you know, this, this is going to look really cool just, you know, sitting on a shelf um, in a corner of the Retro Game Lounge. So, very awesome. So, final thoughts on MagFest? Final thoughts. As my first one, it probably will not be my last. I, I had a good time. I, I mean, agree. I would go back. I would definitely go back. I mean, if nothing else, like, you pay 40 bucks to get in, basically, and I think the arcade experience alone, alone is worth that, because you can play as much as you want. Like, you can go and play from open to close, if you want, and just kind of relive 
the glory days of the arcade. That alone to me be worth forty dollars because there's no way in hell forty bucks worth of quarters wouldn't last you. Right? Day. Oh no, no way. No way. And so, there was a lot of events and stuff that we didn't have time to go yeah, to. There's a lot like, of there's a lot of panels, panels and things like that. I mean these. Dude, these guys were rocking like, all the way like 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. They were yeah. doing panels. Like, this is concerts. Four days, all fucking day. I mean, all four days, all day. So, you know, we have jobs, we have to work, and stuff like that. And we heard Saturday was going to be the biggest day anyway. And I, I would say it probably was. There was definitely a really good turnout there. So, uh, we definitely had a good time, you know. Hopefully, next year, maybe more vendors. That, that's really my only concern. I know, and that's, it's weird to say that. It's like, more people selling shit. But no, at this place, I think it kind of needs a little bit. Yeah, just more games. More I mean, games. That's, I went there mainly as a collector and, you know, for the arcade experience and things like that. Like, I went there, same as a lot of people, you know, go there. They're a collector of video games and video game related stuff. And they're there to, you know, maybe get some unique items that they wouldn't have a chance to buy otherwise. So, I mean, you know, luckily, I did get some things that I wouldn't have a chance to buy otherwise, likely. So, you know, that that's cool. It wasn't like a fucking fail or something. But, right. You know, I mean, it was cool. It was just, you know, maybe next time more vendors. Well, I want to thank everyone so much for stopping by. Um, we hope you've enjoyed this little tour of MAGFest with us. Uh, we had a really good time, uh, you know, letting you guys in on this. For those of you who weren't able to attend, uh, if you are anywhere near the D.C. Metro, you know, vicinity and you want to attend, they hold it every January. Uh, so just check out magfest.org uh, for information. They post the stuff months in advance uh, so you can see what's going on and, and check everything out. And uh, I guess uh, that about wraps up this episode of Retro Game Lounge. Well, as we always say on Retro Game Lounge, we're certainly not running out of games. We're time to play them. Thanks so much for stopping by, everyone, and we'll see you next time. So we were walking around the arcade section, ran into the old friend, Mortal Kombat. Mm -hmm. Played a few rounds. And we, I, at least for me, I quickly realized, and what? no matter how innovative that game was. Why did we think it was cool back in the... That game sucks so it much ass. It's so terrible. It's so horrible. <laughs> it's so horrible. I don't think, did we do three games? Yeah. Two? No, we did three. I, 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 and I, I don't even think the one that we had was working right. The sticks seemed a little bit off. Oh, that's right. The down, the down. Yeah, somebody fix that. The down didn't work. I tried to do Scorpion's Fatalities. That's the only one I remember. I, th I think it's Block Up Up, if I remember right. And oh. Couldn't pull it off. Oh, that just reminded me. What the fuck? Block button? A block button. Block like, button. I'm sure back then that didn't seem that odd. No, back it, then it was the shit. That game sucks so much whole block ass. button. Yeah, so you don't have to hold back. Now that's such a stupid idea because it I, limits you. Oh, I hate that game so much. I don't even know. I don't... I, what? I almost forgot how fighting games were like before combos. No, I know. You know what? There's two games like that. There are two games in history that just hurt my feelings. Mortal Kombat and Pit Fighter. Remember oh. Pit Fighter? Because nothing looked like that. I wasted so much money on that shitty, mm. shitty, shitty, shit, shitty fucking Shit game. Fighter. Shit Fighter. It's so bad. The only thing worse than the arcade version of Pit Fighter is the Super Nintendo version. Oh god, I don't even what? fuck with that. And I have that, as, uh, and it sucks. <laughs> what a piece of shit. That's it. Any guy on the internet talking about guns all the fucking time? Yeah, you need your black friend. We are running around talking about guns like I ain't got no. <laughs> what, what you think I sold them all? <laughs> <laughs>